Hello, this is Phenomenology and my name is Mark Dorsby. In this video we're going to be taking a look at Heidegger's um, book Being in Time and in particular we're going to be looking at section 3 of division 1 the worldhood of the world. So welcome back everyone I hope you're doing well. Um, of course remember that these videos are building so if you missed the previous video make sure to watch it uh, or begin um, at the beginning um, because Heidegger one of the things he's doing in this text is as we continue through his discussion, he's continually refining his his language and ultimately refining his con his conception <clears throat> of the being for whom being is an issue that is Dasein. So, with ultimately the question of the Seinsfrage or the question of what being is in general, sort of somewhere out on the horizon of his concern. So, welcome back. One of the things we've looked at in the first and second sections of Being in Time is namely the idea that for Heidegger, Dasein consists ultimately in the fact that it is a being that's in the world and involved in the world. And we're going to see in today's video, Heidegger is really going to flesh that out even further. Uh, and he's also going to contrast very, there's a really a couple of really important things that he's going to talk about in this section. Um, Heidegger, on the one hand, is going to introduce his conception of the ready at hand. You'll probably recall from section two, as well as section one, Heidegger has been using the language of the present at hand uh, to talk about when things are, when we treat something and we try to consider it as it is in itself, as an object that's present before us, an objective entity. We're going to see that Heidegger doesn't think that this is really the thing, that this isn't very, this is not a very good characterization of the way in which Dasein is actually involved in the world. Of course, Dasein does recognize and interrogate and investigate things in the present at hand, for instance, consider mathematics. Um, but he thinks this is not mainly what we're doing. We're actually living in a world where we're using things as we go and we're treating objects according to our concern rather than according to what they are in themselves. And so he's going to introduce the ready at hand. <clears throat> this will become pivotal um, as he discusses the worldhood of the world. Ultimately, the worldhood of the world consists in that very um, feature of Dasein's being in terms of the ready at hand. And then he's going to talk about the spatiality, ultimately, of um, the world for Dasein. Um, and then, as well as there's a criticism in between there of Descartes' conception of the world as a form of extension in space. So we've got a lot to cover. Um, I'll be honest with you, this took me a very long time to sort of prepare and read through to get ready for you. So uh, we're going to jump into it. I'm going to try to keep this video as succinct as we possibly can um, because it's going to be long. At least that's what I anticipate. So welcome back, everyone. Let's jump in. <clears throat> Excuse me. Paragraph 14 that starts out section 3 is called the idea of the worldhood of the world in general. And of course here Heidegger starts with a sort of question about um, what is the world itself? What exactly is the world? And remember when we talk about being in the world, Heidegger has been approaching this by looking at being in as such, the world as in terms of the worldhood, uh, the world and its worldhood, and then finally being in the world. So. He's building up a concept of Dasein's existential character. Um, and we're starting here with the world. And what is the world in general? What is it itself? Well, as a phenomena, uh, the world is what shows itself in the entities that are within the world. Notice that no one has a perception or an experience of the world. Right? That is, the world is not an entity as such, but the world is rather the place or, or the thing wherein the entities exist. So as a phenomena, the world shows itself in the entities that are within the world. Now, if we were to do a pre-phenomenological description here, what we would say is that, well, on the, there's sort of two steps. On the one hand, we could enumerate the things that are in the world, like houses, trees, people, mountains, etc. I don't know what starts is. I think that was supposed to be something else. Um, so we could enumerate things that are in the world. And step two would be to depict the way that those things look and to give an account of the occurrences in them and that occur with them. So this would be sort of a pre-phenomenological um, analysis of what the world is in general. Uh, and you can see that this is in many ways um, constitutive of certain forms of um, anthropology about the world. Of course, as a phenomenologist, Heidegger, of course, is not going to be doing that, right? Um, here's a quote for you. 
To give a phenomenological description of the world will mean to exhibit the being of those entities which are present at hand within the world and to fix it in concepts which are categorical. So this is ultimately sort of kind of the real goal here is can we fix a phenomenological conception of what the world is? Okay, so that's sort of what we're up to here and you're going to see what that means as we go through. Um, so let's jump here to our next slide. Um, one of the problems here is what we would call the problem of substantiality. And that is ultimately, hold on a moment. My apologies, for some reason my printer just turned on randomly and I, and I assume it was making some noise. So anyway, uh, I've turned that off, so let's get back to it. Um, the problem of sub substantiality. Well, first off, the world is ultimately we take it to be made up of things, right? Um, and our concern here is what is the being of the things of nature, right? Is when we talk about the the world is made up of things, all of those things are natural. And those things are treated as natural insofar as we consider them to have be their own substances. And we can talk about substantiality here. So the question though is what exactly is the ontological significance of a concept of substance, of a concept of substantiality, right? Heidegger uh, writes on two, on page 64, um, neither the ontical depiction of entities within the world nor the ontological interpretation of their being is such as to reach the phenomena of the world. So you can see here we have a bit of a difficulty on our hands and the problem looks like this. Well, how do we reach the world when all of the quote objective renderings of the objects that are in the world always presuppose the world, right? So for instance, what we can do is, in a sort of ordinary philosophical sense, what we could do is we look at the objects in the world, we can evaluate them, um, but one of the things we're going to see is when we uh, look at what those objects are in their essences, in terms of the present at hand here, we get objective renderings, as it were, but all of these objective renderings presuppose the world the, itself, right? Because all of these are entities within the world. So how do we reach the world when this is what all we have? is right in the present at hand so perhaps you might consider well maybe the world is a characteristic of docile's being right for instance does every doc sign have proximally its own world right and in a certain way we do in fact talk like that i mean not insignificantly because of heidegger's influence here but um we do talk as if that we each have our sort of own world right but strictly speaking, the world is not an entity. It's rather the, the place where the entities are. Uh, and it looks like maybe it's a characteristic of Dasein's activity. But you can see if Dasein, <clears throat> if every Dasein proximally has its own world, then does the world become subjective? Uh, that, that is, does the world become ultimately one of subjectivity, um, which of course creates a whole range of problems, especially when the approach has been to analyze entities in the present at hand, what they are in themselves. Um, so how is the world the case then? And how is there a common world? How is that the case? I'm sorry. Um, because even if it's true that, do, that the world is a characteristic of Dasein's being, then if, and if it's not subjective, well, in what sense is it common? Um, and so these are two different problems, though. They certainly could be related. And a third question here we should ask is, well, how can we access the worldhood of the world as such, instead of a subjective or a common rendering of the world. Now recall here in the being in, in being in time, Heidegger is ultimately, he thinks that we have to articulate what the worldhood of the world is, so that we can understand what it means to say that Dasein is a being in the world. Uh, <clears throat> what does it mean to be in a world? What's the, if you will, the essential characteristic of the world as such? This is what we're asking. When, or this is what Heidegger is asking when he asks about the worldhood. So we've got a number of problems on the table. And you'll see in the beginning of this section, it's really just a series of questions. And what Heidegger is trying to do is trying to move us and refine us into a place where at least where we're clear on what sort of answers pertain to these questions. So let's ask this. What exactly is worldhood? Well, on the one hand, whoops. Um, on the one hand, the worldhood refers to an ontological concept. Right, because the world is uh, reflects what must be a primary state for the things that are in the world, for beings as such. Um, so, worldhood must be an ontological concept. 
a world order also has to be a constitutive element in the structure of being in the world. Of course, I've already mentioned that, and that's what we're after. And he's defined this existentially, right? Um, such that worldhood here is an existential. Now, worldhood, of course, also is something that's characteristic of Dasein. And this is really, we'll see this is really important. Um, and as he begins to unfurl his analysis of worldhood here, you'll see that our our uh, parallel concept of Dasein, right, what we understand about Dasein, will also be continually refined here. Now, well, there's sort of four key points that are worth mentioning when we talk about worldhood. The first is an ontical concept. And that's the idea that the world signifies the totality of those entities which can be present at hand within the world. So if we, and remember Heidegger is laying out this, this language between the ontic and the ontological. And this is related, we'll see, to what's known as the ontological difference. I'll get there in a minute. But in this first sense, the world signifies basically all of the entities that are, that we can, we can, um, um, intuit in the present at hand within the whole world. So it's a totality. The second is to think of um, an, uh, the world of the world as an ontological term, right? And remember, ontology signifies the question of being as such for Heidegger. So what an ontological term in this sense would mean is that it signifies the being of the entities in the world, not just the accumulation of the entities, right? Um, there also there's the ontological facticity here, and when we talk about facticity, remember this is Heidegger's con uh, his conception for the idea that we're beings in the world in the sense that it has happened already, right? As it were. Uh, so what we can say here is that the ontological facticity of worldhood is that refers to that wherein a factical Dasein lives. So there's worldhood also in this sense, not just a totality, not just the being of the entities of the world but the fact that Dasein lives in the world. And then fourthly, what we might call, what Heidegger calls, the ontologico-existential concept of worldhood. And this refers to the structural modes for the worlds that Dasein inhabits. This refers to the structural form of existence that Dasein has with the world. So you can see when we talk about the world, we actually can mean the world or in a variety of ways. Uh, so the worldhood can, can be parsed out in these four ways. What you could say is that things which are worldly are not really given as present at hand, right? And this becomes sort of a launching off point for Heidegger here. Because when we talk about something being worldly, especially in this third signification, the ontolo of ontological facticity, we're talking about the way in which Dasein lives in the world. And worldliness there isn't something that's given as something that's present at hand. It's not just an objective determination of something. Something's worldly for in terms of Dasein's facticity insofar as Dasein is living in the world. And of course, Dasein is living in the world. That includes a whole bunch of things that philosophers typically ignore. That includes, for instance, the fact that we have to drink things or the fact that we, we move something out of the way to turn a light switch on. Uh, the fact that when we're driving our car, uh, we flip our signal and turn left. And all of these little minutia that actually take up the majority of my life, right? These are things that philosophers typically ignore. And they concern the ontological facticity of Dasein. And we're going to see that this is the, the avenue that Heidegger wants us to follow when we assess the worldhood in the future and ask the question of what exactly does it mean for us to be beings in the world? One of the things is that he realizes that we have a tendency to pass over the worldhood of the world, right? Dasein doesn't, we don't tip, Dasein doesn't typically get wrapped up in the idea that there is a world that it's, it's living in, right? Dasein is for the, mainly, approximately for the most part, just living in that world, right? We're not usually stopping and turning our attention to the world or the characteristic of what it means to be in a world because the world is sort of the grounding context for all of our involvements and our activities, right? And this is a really important part of our interpretation of the world and of Dasein. The fact that Dasein generally skips over the world, right? Um, so what does this mean? Well, he, it's not that we skip over in the sense that the world of the everyday Dasein, which is closest to it, is the environment. Now, the term for environment that he uses here is the term Umwelt, 
right, in German. And this literally means the around world, um and welt. Welt is the term for world, and um means really, or at least in this signification, it means the aroundness of the world. And particularly, Heidegger mentions that what he's going to be talking about when we talk about the environment is to talk about spatiality and aroundness. So you can see here is that, again, we're going to be focusing up and following up on the world of the world in terms of its being an ontological facticity. And the first thing we'll recognize is that the world is something that's around us. It's given, um, always already present around us and before us, and both in space, but also in terms of our phenomenological involvement. We're going to see what that means today. Now, Heidegger breaks up this section into three sort of um, al um, alpha, um, uh, alpha numeric um, concepts. And the first is the analysis of the environmentality and world in general. So what's typical of Heidegger is he sort of starts with the general and then works his way through. Um, so what exactly are we talking about when we talk about the environment and the world in general? And this leads us to paragraph 15, the being of the entities that are encountered in the environment. Now, it is important here to recognize that when we talk about the world, uh, we're not talking, that's the world is not the same thing as the environment for Heidegger. Um, but in order to understand what the world is, we have to start with the environment. And the environment here is a term that I think needs to be understood in terms of its facticity. The fact that I'm living in the world and there's something that's around me. Right? And consider, while you're sitting here watching this video, or while you're think of you're on the subway and you're going somewhere, or you're on a train, um, the world is more than what's just around you, right? But what is around you is the environment, okay? So the beings of those entities which we encounter as closest to us can be exhibited phenomenologically. So things that are near, not, I don't have a phenomena of the world, but the things that are around close to me, I do have a phenomenal experience of. Now, this phenomenal experience um, comes in the form in, comes in the form of dealings, right? I'm dealing with things on a daily, on a daily, uh, in a daily manner, right? Dasein, as Dasein lives in the world, Dasein is moving things around. Think of your relationship to the keyboard, for instance, the mouse, uh, the printer, the computer screen. All of these are entities, beings in the world, and they populate your environment. And your mode of activity is one in which they are part, that you're dealing with them, as it were, in a manifold of concerns, okay? So, and how am I concerning myself with these things? Well, primarily in terms of use. I'm using these objects, right? So notice, for instance, that I have a highlighter pen here, right? Um, this highlighter... When I'm using it, I, you know, I'm sorry, in my daily life, the facticity of my average everyday life, I, I see the highlighter and I use the highlighter and its existence is only a part of my world insofar as it's something I'm using, right? Uh, I don't consider what the pen is in and of itself. I don't usually think of the pen as present at hand. I usually approach it as something to be used, which is very different than the present at hand. And so what this means is that the environment is populated with entities that are available for Dasein's use, okay? And this will become the pre preliminary phenomenological theme of Heidegger's investigation of Dasein's being in the world, where at the end of the day, it is going to be, it's going to take its point of departure uh, based upon the idea that we, that we are encountering th things in terms of their use. Now, Heidegger does make a, a, a remark of method in this paragraph. He says, quote, this is the way in which every day docile always is. When I open the door, for instance, I use the latch. The achieving of phenomenological access to entities which we encounter consists rather in thrusting aside our interpretive tendencies which keep thrusting themselves upon us and running along with us and which conceal not only the phenomena of such concern, but even more those entities themselves as encountered of their own accord in, in our concern with them. Now, these entangling errors become plain if in the course of our investigation, we now ask which entities shall be taken as our, prelim as our preliminary theme and established 
as our pre-phenomenal basis for our study. Now, that's a, that's a sort of a lot to say there, and I encourage you to pause the video and to just read this passage slower if you need to, right? But what he's sort of saying here is that when we use our everyday, um, is that when we think of how Dasein is all the time in its everyday manner, it's using these objects in the world, and there's a tendency philosophically for us to sort of stop our description of the average everyday life of a person and throw in a whole a whole set of interpretations or interpretive apparatus, I might call them. Um, and he's saying that we get all entangled <clears throat> ultimately in our interpretations and our concerns for things and our average everyday involvement with things. And what we've got to do is we've got to parse this all out so that we can build and articulate a sort of pre-phenomenological basis for the study itself. Now, there's a wrong and a right way for us to go, methodologically, Heidegger indicates. What's the wrong way? Well, we're inclined to then turn our attention to the things and to work out their theoretical objectivities. This is the wrong path. That is, we're inclined to sort of say, okay, well, in my world, I've got pens, I've got lamps, I've got keyboards, etc., etc. Let's do a, a philosophical evaluation of what each of these things are in their own particular essence. And then let's see um, how those things function and relate to Dasein. And he says this is the wrong way to go, in fact. Uh, that this sort of, uh, we might call it the philosophical temptation here, um, or the maybe a better term would be the theoretical temptation to theorize the objectivity of the things we encounter in the world. This is the wrong path, why? Because this is not how we actually use things, right? Um, Right, we have to be attuned to looking at how Dasein actually exists, and Dasein exists in terms of the use of things primarily. Um, so that means that we have to understand what it means to use things, um, and we can't do that by just isolating the objectivities of these things. Now he says, "What's the right path?" Well, and he sort of does. Uh, he takes his Greek, which is fond of doing, um, and then he sort of does a conceptual rework of the original Greek term pragmata. Um, of course, he gives the, the actual Greek determination there. I've just given you the transliteration. But the Greeks had this con concept of that things um, can be understood as pragmata, that is, of things that you use. And Heidegger says, well, okay, this is interesting. Let's recast the language of the pragmata in terms of equipment. And we can see here that Dasein uses things. And what that means is that Dasein is, is organizing its intentional comportment towards things. Um, and it's treating the world in terms of the world being sets and multiplicities of equipment. Um, some which are available for use and some which are not, right? But it's treating the world as a world of equipment, right? Or as he says, we shall, quote, quality, call these entities which we encounter in concern equipment. So this is important. Equipment deno denotes um, the fact that Dasein is a creature that is primordially concerned in terms of its involvement with the world, right? And this is a part of Dasein's ontological facticity, right? Going all the way back what we looked at earlier. Now it's important here to realize that equipment is not its own kind of being, right? Equipment is essentially something in order to, right? Um, so equipment is not an entity as such, it's not a being as such. Equipment is really, if you will, a way in which Dasein treats things and understands things, and its understanding is at its core the idea of something in order to, right? And here we might say, um, though Heidegger probably consciously does not use this language, we might say that equipment is something that's cast in terms of instrumentality, right? Uh, where objects exist for me in, this, in the average everyday sense in terms of how I can use them to do things, right? I use this in order to do this. I use this in order to do, to do this. I need the pen in order to highlight. I need the computer in order to record the lecture, to write my notes, etc., etc. Right, so equipment designates actually a phenomenological structure, not an entity or a being, but a phenomenological intentional comportment towards things. And here, it's really quite helpful to keep in mind all of the stuff we looked at with regard to Husserl, right? Now you can see we're doing something radically different than Husserl, but <clears throat> you can see here that 
equipment, well, you can at least use Husserl to better understand what Heidegger means when he says that equipment is a phenomenological structure, right? Um, it's, a, it's a structure in consciousness regarding the way in which I treat and understand other beings and entities, right? It's a reference um, of something to something. So with equipment, you always have a referential sort of relationship where I have the pen, I'm sorry, the, the highlighter references the text that I highlight, right? The keyboard references the, the web page I'm typing in and searching for, right? So we have a reference of always something conjoined with something else. And this is a part of, if you will, the logic of equipment. So equipment does not show things as they are for themselves or in themselves, right? That's really important. Equipment is rather a designating term of Dawson's concern and involvement with the world, or if you will, our concern and involvement with the world on an average everyday, in an average everyday sense, right? So here's an example. Think about sitting in a room writing and leaning on the desk, right? Uh, so I tried to find a picture of someone doing this, right? And what are some of the characteristics? You're going to see that some things are treated according to the, I'm sorry, that things are treated according to a manifold of concern, right? Um, I'm concerned based upon how I'm organizing what I'm concerned with in terms of my activity, right? So for instance, if I'm writing an essay, as you no doubt will be writing an essay, right? Uh, or, or have written an essay if you're not going to write one. Um, when you're writing an essay, right, um, and I'm leaning on the desk, I'm understanding the beings that are populated, the, the beings with the lowercase b, that are populating my desk according to this manifold, this matrix of concern and involvement that I have going, right? Things are not treated theoretically, right? So I'm not looking at the keyboard saying, hmm, that's a keyboard, et cetera, et cetera, right? I'm treating them as something that just comes and goes, as it were. And things are treated in terms of their dealings, right? Now, this is when Heidegger introduces his really most important concept for this entire section of the worldhood of the world. That is the idea of the readiness to hand, what, the readiness to hand. And he says that we've been talking here about the idea of things in terms of the present at hand, or the present to hand, in terms of when something is taken as a conscious theoretical objectivity, right? When I want to understand being in a theoretical sense, that's the present to hand. But there's this other mode of comportment, the ready to hand. And the ready to hand concerns when my my when I'm describing my factical mode of existence <clears throat> in which I'm treating using things as I go. Now <coughs> excuse me, I apologize. Um now the, the the German term he gives here is the Zuhandenheit. So this is the term you should use. Um, um, you can say the ready to hand, but the Zuhanden is ultimately what he's talking about. Now, the present at hand is the Vorhanden, and the ready to hand is the Zuhanden, okay? Um, and he wants to say that th when we talk about the way in which we're sitting at the desk, when we're involved in terms of use, we're talking in terms of a really a different mode of comportment, a different form of intentionality, if you will. Of course, the most famous example that Heidegger gives is that of the hammer. And he's very fond of talking about hammers, but think, and in fact, just recently, I my, we had a flood at my house, and so I had to I had to rehammer in all of the baseboards that are on the lower floor of the building. I was using a hammer. And when I use a hammer, I just grab it, and I nail things, and I use it. I never consider the hammer as a theoretical object, right? And it's sort of interesting because I noticed that as I was working, I would frequently lose my hammer um, because I'm obviously not a construction worker. I don't know if that's obvious, but I'm not. Um, I'm not very, very good at construction. And so I sort of lose it. Um, and part of the reason I lose it is because when it was no longer useful to me, I would just set it to wherever was available to me, right? Uh, I would lose track of the hammer, and that's an indication of the comport mode of comportment in which I treat the hammer as something to use. I don't treat it as a theoretical object. It's literally ready to hand um, in the sort of literal sense. Now, when we talk about the difference between the present to hand on the one hand um, and the ready to hand on the other, sorry for all the references to hands. I know it's, it's a little bit overwhelming and confusing. The present to hand is this notion of looking without circumspection. Okay, now circumspection is an important sort of term that, frankly, I'm not sure where Heidegger so thus far in being in time uh, before this point 
has really been able to articulate and define what he means by circumspection, but you're going to see it's really, really important. And so what do you think circumspection means, right? Circumspection is the idea that I can move around something and I can see it from different angles and different perspectives. And that doesn't necessarily have to be a description of something physical, right? I can understand something and treat it in terms of use in a variety of different ways, right? When I treat, when I want to, when we look to something in terms of the present to hand, there's no circumspection because I'm trying to understand it as a theoretical objectivity as it is in itself, right? Consider, for instance, here what mathematicians are doing when they're asking the question, what a prime number is, right? They're trying to understand what a prime number is at its essence, regardless of circumspection, right? They don't wanna know what, what it's like for you to use a prime number or what it's like for you to use a prime number. They wanna know what a prime number is without circumspection. Now, by contrast, the ready to hand uh, is a form of consciousness of conscious involvement and in being activity that is fundamentally one of circumspection, where I am looking at it from these different angles and in these different ways, right? On 69, Heidegger writes, the peculiarity of what is proximally ready to hand is that in its readiness to hand, it must, as it were, withdraw in order to be ready to hand quite authentically, right? That is, there's this weird part that when I treat things in the ready to hand, I have this circumspection of things, but there's a way in which the things which are ready to hand sort of withdraw and disappear back into my world, right? So like just recently, I just a moment ago, I just used the example of a pen and I just set the pen down and I kept talking and clicking through the slideshow here. Um, and you can see at that moment, the pen in terms of my circumspection and in terms of my involvement with it sort of withdrew and sort of became, if you will, camouflaged in, into all of the other entities that are populating my desk. Well, why? Because this withdrawal is related to the idea that I, be, I was no longer concerned with it, right? I was no longer had a dealing with it as such, right? So the Zuhan, he's trying to again, try to articulate the Zuhan in here, right? So what are some of the considerations about the Zuhanan that we should recognize? Well, when we talk about the Zuhanan, we're saying that things that are produced are made for the ready to hand, right? So when you make, for instance, I've been drinking this cup as I've been talking, <clears throat> and I apologize, I have sort of a tickle in my throat today. But, that, but this cup was manufactured for someone, why? Well, it was manufactured in order for it to be ready to hand, right? So that people could drink out of it, right? It wasn't created as a... Um, you know, whoever made this, probably someone in China might even say, uh, whoever made this cup did not make the cup for it to be an object of philosophical examination. Ironically, we're doing that right now, kind of. Um, they made it to be ready to hand, something to use. So production is organized towards the ready to hand, right? That's interesting. Number two here, not all the things that are ready to hand are necessarily produced though, right? So for instance, he gives the example of animals in a sort of kind of non-environmental ethicist way, right? He talks about the idea that animals are born and created in the world, but animals don't, they're not created to be treated at the ready to hand, right? But we do treat them to the ready to hand when we eat them, right? When we kill them and eat them, they become objects to use, right? Now it's interesting, he, Heidegger doesn't talk about us, but it's interesting to maybe on the sideline here, think about um, Kant's insistence regarding the treatment of persons here and what it would mean to treat someone in a person in the Zuhandan, which of course is something we do in fact do, right? Um, for instance, consider the way the physician treats the person, the patient who's lying on the ground um, bleeding, right? They'll treat the person as something to be used and, and not used in the sense that they're trying to do one thing for another, but they treat their body, they're trying to, uh, they treat them as a, an, a task to deal with, right? And that can be in the Zuhanan, interestingly enough. So, and by the way, it's important to recognize that the Zuhan and the Vorhan do not have an ethical implication here for Heidegger. I just think there's some interesting questions we might want to be thinking about. Now, as the environment is discovered, nature is thus encountered. So, um, so this is sort of interesting here. So, I have this environment, this around world, this umwelt that's around me, and I'm concerned and I'm dealing with it. And as I'm discovering my environment, nature is gets encountered, 
right? And remember, this term nature for Heidegger always is going to pretty much signify something in terms of the present to hand, right? So nature gets encountered. I begin to recognize that there's certain sorts of things in the world which are the way they are outside of me, and I must concern my involvements in accordance with how they are, right? And so nature gets encountered, and of course, from there, it's just a short hop and a skip away from a theorization about nature and what nature means um, in a sort of scientific sense, you can, you can see here. Uh, and by the way, notice that the scientist treats nature in the present to hand, that's important. Now, when Dasein works, not only does it encounter things as ready to hand, but it also discovers entities that are like Dasein. So that's another really, really big important part is, and we'll see this will become play a large role at the end of Division One for Heidegger, which is namely that Dasein recognizes that there's other beings that are also um, acting in a concernful manner towards the world, and they're treating the world as it were in the Zuhanden, right? Now, readiness to hand is the way in which entities, um, is the, I'm sorry, let me reread this. Readiness to hand is the way in which entities as they are in themselves are defined ontologico-categorically, right? So this is part of one of the things that Heidegger is constantly doing is he's sort of plugging in here a specific terminological distinction for what he means here, right? So, of course, so it's the ontological categoricalization of things um, that the ready to hand treats them. Um, and so that's sort of important here. Um, and I put a clock up here as an example, right? Now, one of the questions that's worth interest that's worth asking here is number one: Is the Vorhanden or the Zuhanden logically prior? Which one is more fundamental? In the order of Heidegger's treatise, he began by with the present to hand, but now he's introduced the ready to hand and the distinction. So, which one of these is more fundamental? Which one's logically prior? Certainly, for Dasein's facticity. Heidegger is going to argue that the Zuhanden is, right? And I realize I have a misspelled German word here. So for all my Germans watching, my apologies, and for everyone else too. Um, now, what of course is the relationship between the two becomes an important question. Um, <clears throat> and this leads us to section 16, which I think is a little bit obscure um, section actually. Um, but paragraph 16 is how the worldly character of the environment announces itself in the entities within the world, right? The world's not an entity in the world, so in what way is there a world? This is an important question because, remember, if entities exist in the world, the world's not itself a being in the world, right? Because the world is where the beings are. So what does it mean to talk about a world? Well, the everyday, uh, pardon me, the everydayness of Dasein's being in the world is the first thing to see here, right? Is that, and is that Dasein, in its everyday sense, has different modes of concerns, right? Has different modes of concerns. So some of those are Zuhanen, and some of them are Vorhanen, actually, right? So this is how we encounter the worldly character of things, right? Now I'll consider a couple different things here, right? For example, some um, something ready to hand becomes unready to hand. For instance, consider a broken computer. Um, now, he says, for instance, that it looks like what can happen is you're, like when I, he of course doesn't give the example of a computer, but he would be fine with the example. I'm using the computer and suddenly the computer stops working. Um, and then it's no longer available to me in order, in terms of the order of the concern I have, right? I can't type my paper, I'm upset and frustrated, so there's something wrong with the computer. Um, and so then the question becomes, at that moment, because it's no longer something that's usable, the computer can potentially become present to hand to me. I start to consider what's wrong with this computer. What is this computer exactly? How can I figure it out? How can I understand what it is essentially? That is, how can I reframe it as a theoretical objectivity so that ultimately I can get back to using it, right? We've all, in probably some of you watching this today, in fact, have had to deal with a computer that stops working and you suddenly have to sort of move out of the Zuhan and into the Vorhanen, right? So pure present at hand announces itself in such equipment, but only to withdraw to the readiness hand of something else. So we get sort of these sporadic moments of the present to hand, but as it were, everything always seems to go back to the readiness to hand. So the unusability of objects and the ready to hand in terms 
I'm sorry, the unusable objects are ready to hand in terms of obtrusiveness. It became present to hand and no more, right? So you can talk about obtrusiveness. And in this section, Heidegger talks about sort of three different ways that this can happen, or three different attributes of the sort of ways of our involvement. And that is in terms of the conspicuousness of things, the obtrusiveness of things, and the obstinacy of things. Okay? So ultimately on 74, we read that the structure of the being of what is ready to hand as equipment is determined by references or assignments, right? So here's important. Um, how I know how to use things depends on upon, number one, how I'm referring something to something else, but it also depends upon how I assign things and how I understand something, right? Um, this is very, very important because this means that we ultimately have to understand what it means to have a sign and what it means to have a reverent. And we're going to see he comes to this in a little bit. Now, because when equipment breaks, you get a disturbance. Sorry, another misspelled word. And the disturbance sort of announces itself. The environment announces itself anew. And so we get a sort of disclosure. So it's quite interesting here because Heidegger seems to be giving us this example of that when things go wrong, we actually become, we can use our, that observation as a means for better understanding what it is things really are in our average everyday life. Uh, they're given as zuhant, right? So in such private expressions as inconspicuousness, unobtrusiveness, and non-obstinacy, what we have in view is a positive phenomenal character um, as the being of that which is proximally ready at hand. And then he also writes on the next page, that which can be lit up most, um, that which can be lit up, and lit up means for him sort of when things may become apparent to me, uh, when I sort of see something, it's lit up, right? So that's which can be lit up must already be disclosed. It's already in my environment and disclosed to me. So the world is therefore something wherein Dasein, as an entity already was, and if in any manner it explicitly comes away from anything, it can never do more than come back to the world, right? Dasein is always propelled back into the world. When something, right, um, and so that's really sort of an interesting part here. And you can see here that he's slowly crafting a more rigorous conception of what worldhood is. Now, we talked about references, and I mentioned um, just previously the idea that this means that we have to ultimately uncover a better, do a better job of understanding what a reference is what references and signs are. Okay, so uh, we come across equipment in terms of signs. So I recognize something um, as an equipment because there's certain signs, and these are given phenomenally to me, but I recognize certain signs regarding what those things are, what, those be what the being of those entities consist in, insofar as I can use it for my concern, my, my dealings, etc. So the sign structure actually provides an ontological clue, whoa, uh, for characterizing any entity whatsoever, right? So this idea that we have signs is really important, right? Because signs show and they indicate, right? Now, um, re referring or referencing is a way of relating things together. And then, by the way, there's an asymmetry here because not every referring is a sign, but every sign does a referring, right? Um, so that's an important point here. Every, or here it is, I have it written. Every reference is a relation, but not every relation is a reference. So that's the asymmetry again. Now, among the signs are symptoms, right? Um, so to recognize a sign is to recognize what it points towards, right? Um, but the and before I recognize the sign, I recognize symptoms that are related to the sign. Traces, residues, documents, testimonies, etc. And when he says residues, I can't help but consider here um, the, the way in which Edmund Husserl utilizes the language of the residuum, right? Phenomenological residuum. So when I see something I can use and I recognize, I recognize the sign, there's also residues of meaning. There maybe are sort of on the outskirts and related to. Heidegger actually gives the example of a turn signal in a car. Um, and of course, um, I, this is not a car from when Heidegger was alive, uh, but he gives the example. It's, he, it's funny too, because all of our cars have turn signals now, but he says, some cars now have turn signals, right? Um, 
So what is a turn signal doing, right? Well, the sign is an item of equipment which is ready to hand for the driver and is concerned with driving, right? So it's good, it's, so for instance, as I'm driving the car, I use the turn signal, and it's a part of equipment that's ready to hand for me as the driver. But guess what? It's also something that's ready to hand as a sign for the people behind me so they can see where I'm going, right? And so these are, this indicates some of the symptoms that sign, some of the signs and the symptoms as it were, right? Now, here's a couple of quotes I've gotten. And by the way, I should mention that as I was putting together this presentation, it became sort of overwhelming. And I was, didn't do a good job of always including the pagination. So um, I'm just following, I should know, I'm just following Heidegger systematically. And pretty much everything I have in this presentation comes from Heidegger directly. If not directly, uh, I paraphrased it. So, uh, But where I could and where I remembered, I included the citation. So my apologies. You'll do better, hopefully, when you write your papers. Now, <clears throat> here's some quotes here. So this indicating which the sign performs can be taken as a kind of referring, right? But here we must notice that this referring as indicating is not the ontological structure of the sign as equipment, right? So when we talk about the way in which a sign refers, that's not an ontological description here, okay? Instead, referring as indicated is grounded in the being structure of equipment in terms of serviceability for, right? So if we're going to talk about the ontology of equipment, um, and what we can say is that referring is a part of the, the structure, the ontological structure for equipment, right? Because remember, we said equipment was a phenomenological determination. Um, and so that means that equipment has a being structure, and that being structure takes its place in terms of the serviceability of things, right? So things are serviceable in terms of how they refer, right? Et cetera, et cetera. So indicating as a reference is a way in which the towards which of a serviceability becomes ontically concrete, right? Um, so we, so this is sort of where you can sort of link up here the referring in the non-ontological sense with the ontological sense. Um, that is, um, the ontological sense becomes concrete as a kind of referring within the equipment, right? So signs, what does that mean about signs? Signs address the circumspection of our concernful dealings. Two, signs let the ready-to-hand be encountered and secure our orientation in concernful dealings, right? Because, remember, signs are, help me organize how I'm going to work with things. So I have this keyboard here. And notice that I have these little squiggly letters on top of the keys, right? Those are signs that indicate and refer certain functions for the machine, right? Um, and, they, and so those signs organize and orient me in terms of my concernful dealings, right? So when I'm trying to write something, um, that, that's how, that is the, a description of my factical involvement with the keyboard, right? One important type of activity, of course, is the establishment of signs. And interestingly enough, this is what Heidegger is really doing, right? In the whole text, Heidegger is laying out systematically a whole new set of philosophical terms. What are these terms? They're signs. And what are these signs? They're referring, right? What are they referring? Well, namely, the involvement of Dasein's activity in the world as a being in the world, right? But the establishment of a sign does not necessitate the production of equipment. So just because you establish a sign, it doesn't mean you have to make things that are ready to hand, right? So the wider the extent of a sign, the narrower the intelligibility and the usefulness will be, right? So that's quite interesting sort of dichotomy to think about here. Again, the wider and the extent of a sign, the more that a sign signifies, the narrower and the, and the, narrower the usefulness of that sign will be. Um, now think here, for instance, of a sign for something that's quite um, quite large in its extent or quite wide, and you'll see there's not it, the wider something uh, a sign refers to something, then the less useful it really can become for me. So that's quite interesting uh, sort of dichotomy. Now Heidegger indicates that there is a threefold relationship between signs and references. Now, I should mention that philosophically, there's a very long and a huge literature about signs and references, um, and I'm not gonna go into any of that now, but you should be aware that there's a lot of other philosophers 
especially uh, thinking of Frege, for instance, and Wittgenstein, who are concerned with these same issues. Of course, from a very different point of departure than Heidegger. Uh, okay, so what are the threefold relations between these? Well, one, um, th there's an indication, indicating is founded upon the equipment structure as such, right? So it depends upon the structure of the equipment in terms of what gets indicated and how. Two, the indicating which the sign does is an equipmental character of something that's ready to hand, right? Okay, that makes sense. Number three, the sign is not only ready to hand with other equipment, but in its readiness to hand, the environment becomes in each case explicitly accessible for circumspection. So you can see Heidegger is bringing back into his analysis here, he's folding it in the way a baker folds in flour and butter, right? He's folding back in his recognition of the way in which the environment plays a fundamental role in terms of it, the, the umwelts, um, concern, the current concernful dealings I have in the umwelt, right? Um, so he's bringing that here. So what will we say here is that on 82, he writes, a sign is something that's ontically ready to hand, which functions both as this definite equipment and as something indicative of the ontological structure of readiness to hand, of referential totality, and of worldhood, right? So the worldhood of the world is given according to these indicating signs um, of my concernful involvement regarding what? The Zuhanten. So what I want you to remember as we've been going through this is that when we talk about um, the worldhood of the world, this is where we're talking about the Zuhanden, okay? And in the Zuhanden is to talk about our involvement with the world. And this is what signs are doing when they indicate things to me, right? Um, here's what I'm going to do before I continue this, because I uh, this video is I'm almost an hour in. I'm going to stop this video. I'm going to start up on part two um, with this, the involvement and the significance, the worldhood of the world. So, And then in part two, we'll conclude... Um, part three, the world out of the world. Okay. So that's what we've got going on. Thanks guys for watching. I know this has been a long video. I hope it's helpful and interesting. We'll see you guys online.